Just over a decade ago, a YouTube channel, Mega Steak Man, uploaded a parody trailer for a live action Pokemon movie called Apocalypse. I want to be the best. Like no one ever was. Ash, there are no more masters. Everything we've worked for is gone. Can't you see the fights are getting worse? Pikachu's gonna die in those pits. They reimagined a dark and edgy Pokemon world with graphic violence and the actual threat of death, a stark contrast from the bright childhood adventures about friendship we were so used to seeing. This trailer and many fan-made parody trailers that came after it from different YouTube channels were mocking a trend that had become really popular in movies and TV of the late 2000s and would continue on through the 2010s and now the 2020s. The overly grim, dark, gritty adaptation. This is the 1960s Batman TV series starring Adam West. It ran from 1966 to 1968 and had 120 episodes. This show was groundbreaking in so many ways. There had been adaptations of Batman prior to this show, but this was in full colour, had a big budget and an amazing cast. It embraced the source material, often adapting storylines from the comics in the first season. And last but certainly not least, it had an addictive theme song. This show was primetime viewing, meaning adults, teens and young children were gathered around their TV sets twice a week to watch the adventures of the Crepe Crusader and the Boy Wonder. It was full-on cheesy satire. They took the outlandish plots from the comics and played them completely straight, which added to the humour. It was truly a live-action cartoon, with the use of the Bam and Walsh on-screen comic effects, which I believe was done to save money and to appeal to censors who may have complained about the violence. The series was popular and had run in syndication for decades. I remember watching the show as a child when I was sick. Generations are familiar with Adam West as Batman, even if they never watched the show, because it has been referenced a lot in pop culture. For a long time, this was the most popular depiction of Batman outside the comic. Comic book writers and fans who were adults were embarrassed by this. They wanted their hobby to be taken seriously and to prove that superhero comics were not just for children. While researching this video, I watched quite a few documentaries about superhero media and they all talk about this need to prove that these stories were capable of being serious, adult and mature. That was not my Batman. That, that Batman was a joke and it was like they were making fun of my Batman. When the 1989 Batman movie was in development, the producers pitching the project wanted to capture the original concept of Batman shown in the 1930s comic, but studio execs could only envision the popular TV show. Then in 1986, the comic book The Dark Knight Returns is released and does numbers. This was followed by many other superhero comics like The Watchmen and The Killing Joke that were more grim dark in nature, a complete departure of the Silver Age era of superhero comics. These works were a critical and commercial success and were very influential. People look at what is popular and try to replicate the formula to achieve that same level of popularity with varying degrees of success. This applies to just about everything. So with superhero comics at the time, everyone was going for the grim dark in hopes that they could be the next Watchmen. But most of those works were quite hollow. H Bomber Guy made a video a few years ago about the Killing Joke movie and talked about the oversaturation of dark and gritty superhero comics that were being made in the 80s and 90s. Basically, this need to be seen as serious and mature often produced work that was quite immature. Like, it was a bit too much. But yeah, producers of the 1989 Batman were able to point to the Dark Knight Returns comics and say to studio exec, this is the vibe we're going for. People love it, look at all the money it's making. That got them the green light and they were able to get Tim Burton on board and you had this new, sleek, gothic and violent Batman movie. Batman was cool again for a whole new generation and Batman the Animated Series was also given the go-ahead. The sequel Batman Returns, also directed by Tim Burton, was just as dark and gothic where there was a slight touch of that stylized Tim Burton whimsical kookiness that you expect to see with the director's previous works like Edward Scissorhands and Beetlejuice and Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Even though the sequel was successful, Warner Brothers felt that it should have made more money, especially since Batman Returns faced backlash from parents for being too violent and it didn't help that McDonald's severed their Happy Meal tie-in. So Warner Brothers wanted more money, which caused them to pivot the series to be more mainstream and kid-friendly and to win back that lucrative Happy Meal tie-in deal. In Batman Forever, Tim Burton stepped down as director and assumed the producer role and Joel Schumacher was brought in as director. This movie's tone was a lot lighter to appeal to children. Can I 
persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through. The movie got mixed reviews but made more money than the previous one. And in case it wasn't clear to you before. Cash fools, everything around me. Green, get the money. Dollar, dollar bill, yo. Then we got the last movie. Batman and Robin, a movie that was rushed into production. With Batman the Animated Series doing so well, this movie was going to be a cartoon too. Very much for the kids, very much buy all these toys. It was like Joel Schumacher saw that one bit from The Simpsons where Adam West said, And how come Batman doesn't dance anymore? Remember the bat to see? <clears throat> Yo, hey, yeah, yeah. I know what. yeah, why doesn't Batman dance anymore? He went full on camp, taking inspiration from the 60s Batman show and the comics from the Silver Age. Schumacher is a gay man and he wanted to make this thing look like a pride parade. Modern Girls and Patrick Willems both made videos about Joel Schumacher's Batman movies that go more in depth. But what you need to know is, people hated this movie, especially the die hard fans. So here we go again. Back to square one of trying to prove that superheroes can be seen as mature and not purely in the realm of kids' entertainment. They could be grounded, where characters didn't utter a catchphrase or make a silly pun every five minutes. Ooh. Talk about your cold shoulder. Enter the new age of superhero movies in the early 2000s that began with Blade in 1998 and would continue with X-Men and Spider-Man. Movies like X-Men will do their best to distance themselves from their past iterations and the popular cartoons by making self-referential one-liners. you actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? But then, then came Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy that stood above the rest. This elevated Batman. I don't even need to explain why or how. There's videos all over YouTube doing just that. What I'm trying to say is that The Dark Knight became the barometer for how superhero movies and action movies in general really are measured. Was this successful as The Dark Knight? Was this as loved by critics as The Dark Knight was? Batman Begins was the first live action Batman since Batman and Robin and the trilogy went on to make a lot of money which caused everyone to look at it and say, oh, I got it. If you wanted to reboot a failed property, kickstart a franchise or revamp a series to appeal to an older audience, Give it the Dark Knight treatment. I mean, look how well it worked for Superman. You see, when this becomes the go-to for being perceived as grounded, mature, deep and cutting edge without really having that much to say about anything, the results are just laughable. Save Martha! Why did you say that name? Do you know how hard I laughed when I found out that It's Clobbering Time had a dog origin story in Fantastic Four 2015? This is not Chronicle. This was not needed. It was just a fun catchphrase, bruv, like... It's Clobbering Time! It was just a fun catchphrase. Just leave it. I know this portion of the video is called Blame Batman, but that was just to shake the table a little bit. The truth is, this happens with plenty of genres. Let's step away from superheroes into the world of fantasy fiction. Remember that show Game of Thrones? <laughs> the show that left people squinting at their TVs as they tried to adjust their settings. Well, when it was popular, everyone wanted their own Game of Thrones. Everyone wanted to be the next big thing. While some studios scoured the fantasy section of a bookstore, others would take properties they already own and try to sprinkle some of that Game of Thrones seasoning on it. Don't know if you heard, but there were rumours that Amazon's Lord of the Ring TV series and Netflix live action Avatar The Last Airbender could be more mature. I think we all know what that means now. You see this even happening with the magical girl genre too. The success of Madoka Magica birthed a whole bunch of similar grim dark magical shows aimed at an adult male audience that, which you know, wasn't as good as Madoka. At my old job, I was talking anime with two male co-workers and I mentioned I tried to keep up with the latest Pretty Cure series. They started raving about how Puele Magi Madoka Magica, yes, got it right on the first time, and how Madoka just shits on all the other magical girls that came before it because it's so subversive. It's a deconstruction with themes around death and sacrifice. The transformation of these magical girls being a metaphor for coming of age in a cruel world and it changing you. And then in the same breath, admitting to not watching that many magical girl series. What they had watched were a few episodes of badly dubbed versions of Sailor Moon and Cardcaptor Sakura, two anime that had heavily censored dubs. 
As someone who absolutely loves the magical girl genre, I had to let them know that those themes mentioned before has always been there and that series that are subversive and deconstruct the genre have existed way before Madoka. Hello, Princess Tutu. Even the pink-haired girl and the purple-haired girl thing is old. Then one of them said, It just felt more mature because it wasn't super girly. Okay. This brings me to my next point. When it comes to popular franchises geared towards a female demographic, rarely do they get the adaptations that they deserve. There's been numerous Superman and Batman cartoons, movies, TV series, etc. and just a handful of Wonder Woman media. I forever remain bitter that Dragon Ball has almost 100 video games. No, I'm not exaggerating, they really do have 100. But Sailor Moon only has 35, the most recent ones being mobile puzzle games, a good portion of which are fan-made. Things that are intended for girls are often mocked and derided. Terms like chick flit and chick lit were and still kind of are used pejoratively to dismiss them as frivolous works compared to real literature. TV shows, movies, video games that have a large female and queer fan base are sometimes not seen as legitimate works compared to works that have a largely male fan base. The magical girl genre can be extremely girly and is one of the obvious examples to point to when talking about female power fantasies. I mentioned earlier that the first card Captor Sakura English dub went through some censoring because of all that gay stuff, just like Sailor Moon did. But I think Sakura got it worse. The whole show was restructured to appeal to boys, dropping a lot of the romance plots, because boys don't like romance storylines, I guess. Card Captor Sakura was turned into Card Captors, an action adventure show about collecting magical cards. Having a large male fan base is seen as a lot more lucrative and is sought after than having a mostly female one. Shows have been cancelled or rumoured to have been cancelled because they were getting a mostly female audience instead of the intended male one. I mean, I've heard executives say this, you know, not, not where I am, but at other places, is being like, we do not want girls watching these shows. Why? That's 51% of the population. They don't buy toys. The girls buy different toys. The girls may watch the shows. So you can sell them t-shirts if they don't. A, a I disagree. I think girls buy toys as well. Maybe not as many yeah. as fucking boys do, but... B, sell them something else, man. Like that, just don't be lazy and be like, well, I can't sell a girl a toy. Sell them a t shirt, man. Sell them a fucking umbrella with a yeah. fucking character on it, something like that. But like, if it's not a toy, there's something else you could sell them. Like, just because you can't figure out your job, don't kill chances of like something that's going to reach an art. Like, that's, it's just so self defeating when people go like, these are the same fuckers go, oh, girls don't read comics. The girls aren't into comics. It's all self-fulfilling prophecies. They just make it that way by going like, I can't sell them a toy. What's the point? That's the thing. And I, and I hate being Mr. Sour Grapes here, but I'll, I'll just put it late on the line. That's the thing that got us canceled on Tower Prep. Honest to God was it's like we need boys, but we need girls right there, right? One step behind the boys. We, you know, This is the network talking. One step behind the boys, not as smart as the boys, not as interesting as the boys, but right there. And then we began writing stories that got into the the two girls' backstories, and they had and they were really interesting. And suddenly we had families and girls watching, and girls really became a big part of our audience. In sort of like they picked it up that Harry Potter type of serialized way, which is why the Batman and boarding schools were really going to kill. Right. But the Cartoon Network was saying, "Fuck no, we want boys' action. It's boys' action, and it's goofy boy humor. We got to get that in there, and we can't." And I'd say, "But look at the numbers. We've got parents watching with the families and." Then they break it down. Yeah, but so many, we've got too many girls. We need more boys. That's heartbreaking. And then that's why they canceled us and they put on a show called Level Up, which is, you know, goofy, you know, nerds, you know, fighting CG monsters. You know, it's like we don't want the girls because the girls won't buy toys. We had a whole, we had a whole uh, merchandise line for Tower Prep that they shit canned um, before it ever got off the launching pad because it's like, boys, 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 boys buy the little spinny tops. They buy the action figures. Girls buy prints. When I first saw the trailer for Fate, I was instantly reminded of the Gem and the Holograms movie. This movie failed big time. Not only does it not resemble the 80s cartoon at all, it has more in common with the Justin Bieber movie that was also directed by John M. Chu. Gem was aged down, she wasn't a label owner anymore. All the glitter, glam, fashion and fame, the fun science fiction and actual holograms were replaced by a story that was grounded in reality. 
And I'm using that term loosely because Jerrica singing in her bedroom with blurry 480p quality got a few hundred thousand views. And that's not enough views to be considered viral in 2015. They also lied to the fans as well. Remember that? I read that John M. Chu originally wanted to make a big budget gem movie, possibly set in Japan with the plot revolving around Vocaloids. That sounds like fun, but that also costs money. And glittery pink girl things don't get a big budget unless it's a Disney princess movie. So no, he's your generic getting famous and falling out with your friends and family, then almost losing yourself plot that we've seen before. The Cheetah Girls and Josie and the Pussycats did it a whole lot better. Oh, and did you know at the end of the movie, they hinted at a sequel with the Misfits as the antagonist? And Pizzazz was played by Kesha? That's the movie that this should have been. Why tease a better movie? Speaking of Josie and the Pussycats, it's about time that movie is finally being recognised as the smart satirical takedown of the music industry, celebrity fame and influence that it was. They did all of that while being bright and colourful and staying quite true to the cartoon, but updated to fit the year that it was made. What is it about these girly movies from the late 90s and 2000s that were not marketed properly being recognised for their brilliance decades later? Hmm. One more thing to point out, after watching a bunch of TV shows and movies of these cartoons turned live action, there is so much colourism, far too much colourism. Fate whitewashes Musa and Flora and I was really surprised that Aisha was dark skinned, given how young dark skinned girls are hard to come by on Netflix. And also how in later series of Winx Club and even in World of Winx, they lighten Aisha and Flora's skin tone quite a lot. Okay, okay. I've put this off long enough. Time to actually watch this show. See you in six hours. Wings Club is an animated magical girl series about six girls attending the fairy school Althea. While there, they discover ancient mysteries, unlock dormant powers, fall in love, and fight against the evil forces that wish to do them harm. The show was known for being cute and fun, the friendship between all the girls, the interesting world building and storylines, and of course, the fashion. Fate the Winx Saga is something else. It's your run-of-the-mill angsty teen fantasy show. If I told you this show was based off a relatively popular young adult novel from 2009 called The Fairy Chronicles, I'm sure some of you would believe me. If you have never watched Wings Club or only have a passing knowledge of it, I suggest watching Unicorn of Wars videos to give you a complete and thorough rundown of the cartoon because they are the expert. What I'm about to do is just give you a rundown about things I did and I didn't like about Fate. It didn't matter what your gender was, you could be a fairy or a specialist. Male fairies were only ever hinted at in one of the Wings Club movies and male magic users that were in the series were either paladins, elves and so on. So I liked that they had the variety of girls being specialists, that was really good. From the trailer I already saw that they combined Althea and Red Fountain into one school. That was an obvious change, you know, I didn't think they would have the budget to film in three different and pretty looking castles. The Changeling storyline was an interesting addition. Changelings come up a lot in Celtic fairy myths, so why not play with that to bring in something new? In a way, Bloom from the cartoon could be considered a changeling. Although she wasn't swapped, her adopted parents just found her and raised her, and Bloom already knew she was adopted. But this whole changeling thing was a nice little addition. The love triangle between Stella Sky and Bloom wasn't as annoying as I thought it would be. There were no catty insults or back of bitch he's mine moments, so that was good. Alright, that's all I can think of of the good. Ugly clothes. We've all dried the clothes, but they were really ugly. I liked what the older women were wearing though. The costume designer knows how to dress for middle-aged women. Too bad for the younger girls though. Don't worry, there's no need to make a Harry Potter reference or comparison. They already did that for you. We get it. You are a show for the big kids. No need to mock Tinkerbell and the fairy wings. We get it. You are super hardcore and say bad no-no words like fuck good for you. I didn't really vibe with this whole magic system. To me, it felt like a combination of Avatar The Last Airbender, The Witches from Charmed, and X-Men. So like everyone has an ability or element that they control and they have to master it. They don't really have any spells that they have to learn besides potion mixing. I was hoping that at least they would apply makeup with magic and they don't even do that. The Witches from The Craft Legacy do that. 
the witches from Craft Legacy are more like the Winx Club than these girls are. They had more sparkles too. Fat phobia. Why? Mean, evil, bisexuals or sexually fluid people. Again, why? They wouldn't have all these issues that they were having if they had a cool advanced fairy technology. Techno could have sorted all of their problems out. This barrier that they have up is absolutely useless. Anyone can just wander out willy-nilly. No fence or gate, no special magic pass that lets you in and out of the school. There are evil things running around and murking people left and right. They need to step their security up. What is going on? Farragonda in the cartoon could never. Griselda would never. The world was boring. In the cartoon, going from planet Earth to the magical science fantasy world that was Magic City and Althea, Red Fountain, all these other places, all these realms, there was a big contrast that you were stepping out of the regular world that Bloom came from into this new mystical world full of possibility. Other TV shows and movies where characters are transported from our mundane world into a new fantastical world, like, you should be able to tell the difference through set design alone. Even on a budget, because I watch a lot of cheap movies from sci-fi, and even they managed to pull it off. Pushing Daisies, a low fantasy show, had a unique visual design to it. Once Upon a Time, even. The Good Place. All fun, colourful visuals that let you know that you're not in Kansas anymore. Just with a few crystals here and there, some cool lighting effects and interesting hairstyles and accessories could have made all the difference. The witches, known as the tricks, they aren't here. What we do get is a fairy called Beatrix. Beatrix. Tricks witches combined into a character called Beatrix, who is boring. I don't even know if witches even exist in this world or not. Was the character Rosalind lying or not? What are blood witches? What, what is going on? If witches do exist, I hope they're not all evil. Because in the cartoons, witches weren't all evil. It was just the three of them who were the main antagonists. This Riverdale-style cringy meta writing where someone says, are you really playing into that archetype? Can we just ice that? Like, Bloom being more super special than she was before. She's Jean Grey. She's the Avatar. She's the super duper special. The characters were very annoying and didn't bond enough for me to believe that they were all suddenly friends, that they would risk it all for each other so quickly, especially Stella. Aisha, as expected, was the token black best friend. She's the only one that doesn't really get an arc of her own. She takes care of Bloom most of the time. It's, are you okay? I'm gonna say, are you okay? Oh, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. I mean, six million different ways to Sunday. I have to figure out a million different line readings for the same line because whatever thing is going on, it's not about the black people or what we're going through. It's, are you, white person in peril, okay? Everyone else gets their own little personal arc and character development, but Aisha, no. We get the smallest, tiny little bit of personal conflict with her being a good student and struggling with one thing, but nobody really helping her and... <sighs> She's also not a princess either. I expected this as soon as I learned that Brian Young, who works on Vampire Diaries, was a showrunner. The way how that show, Vampire Diaries, treated Bonnie Bennett, the way how they treated black women in general. Mm. Bennett Brigade, where are you? Stand up. Like, I've been watching these types of shows since Buffy and if there's a black girl there, I already know what the deal is. I didn't like that they couldn't transform either. Yeah, 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 budget and all that, but this is based off of a magical girl show, God damn it! If I could make one small change, like keep everything the same, but make one small change... Okay, say if the magic to transform was lost. Okay, cool. Near the end, the burned ones are attacking the school. They're closing in, they're about to attack, and the five girls are outside. Bloom tells them to get back, stay away, but they're like, no, Bloom, we're not leaving you. They join hands and are all ready to fight. Their hearts are joined as one, uniting all the elements. And then in a burst of light and glitter and sparkles and magic, they all transform into their fairy magical girl forms. And the energy that they just expelled by transforming kills up all the burned ones. And before they can even comprehend what just happened to them, they all de-transform. But everyone's looking in them with awe, like, oh my god, how were they able to access the ancient magic? What's going on? That way, 
Bloom can still be special, but she's not the super duper special that she is now. And it shows that the girls are united with the power of love and friendship, juxtaposed to the adults who are kept together by fear, vengeance and the thirst for power. That's just my change. So yeah, as you can tell, I didn't really like this show that much. But like I always say with shows I don't really care for, is that it will find its audience. People who have never heard of The Wings Club or have just a basic knowledge of it and want a new teen fantasy show to watch are probably going to eat this up. And good for them! It's just funny to me how they claimed it was made for my demographic. Fans that watch the cartoon as kids and... I don't really see too many Wings Club fans praising fate. Maybe they're all just super quiet and if you do love the show, speak up. Be proud of it. Fate the Wings Saga is the latest of angsty supernatural teen slash young adult dramas that has come out since Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Buffy was influential and left her mark all over TV. I just don't think that Wings Club had to be another child of Buffy. I started wondering what would a live action Wings Club that was true to the source material even look like? And well... This is Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, the live action series. When the first trailer for Fate the Wind Saga was released, I saw a few memes comparing it to Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. For those who don't know, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, or PGSM as I will be referring to it, is the 2003 live action adaptation of the Sailor Moon manga Dark Kingdom arc, the one where Queen Beryl's the big bad. The creator of Sailor Moon, Nako Takauchi, was much more involved in the production of the series compared to the anime. As you can see, this is a tokusatsu show, very similar to the style of Super Sentai or Power Rangers as it's known in the West. This brought the Sailor Moon franchise full circle as Takauchi was inspired by Super Sentai to create an all-girls superhero team. PGSM is obviously aimed towards kids and for the tweens and pretty much all fans of Sailor Moon. I watched the show for the first time back when I was 12 years old after I read the better translated version of the manga. Thank you, Tokyo Pop. Remember Tokyo Pop? This show feels like Sailor Moon. Although it shared more similarity to the manga compared to the first season of the anime, they weren't afraid to do their own thing. New characters were introduced, there were shifts in personalities, different villain motivations, different character arcs. They explored new storylines and played with the lore of the Silver Millennium, all these things that they never got a chance to do in the anime, manga or the musical. Rewatching this series for the third time, I found some similarities to Fate. The girls didn't become friends right away compared to their animated version. That's something I do not mind because friendships do take time to form. So with Rei, her personality resembled her manga counterpart more but was taking a few steps further. She was hesitant to form a close relationship with others. She treated Ami and Usagi as co-workers at first before eventually warming up to them. Then when Makoto arrived, she was standoffish on her too until they got their own episode when they went off on their own little adventure that delved deeper into Rei's relationship with her father. PGSM does have way more episodes than Fate so there's a lot more time for character development and team building episodes. The events that took place in Fate felt like they happened over the course of a week or two. But anyways, I want to talk about Naru real quick. In the manga, as more sailor soldiers were introduced, Naru, who was Usagi's best friend, was just forgotten about. In the manga, she gets pushed into the background scenery. In the anime, she was a familiar face the audience knew that Sailor Moon could rescue all the time. She does get a small romantic storyline with Nephrite that ends in tragedy one of my favourite top episodes, but she eventually fades into the background. The last episode she was in hinted that Naru had figured out that Usagi was Sailor Moon. Now in the live action, Naru never fades away. Usagi even tells her everything, and she's even there for Usagi and Mamoru's wedding in the future. One of my favourite episodes is where Naru is feeling left out that Usagi keeps leaving her to hang out with Ami and won't tell her why. And Naru is jealous. That spoke to 12 year old me. In secondary school, friends I knew all through primary school were hanging out with new people and I couldn't help but feel a little bit left out too. I know it may be off-putting at first glance when you look at that sweet early 2000s TV CGI budget, but they make up for that with charm and it's tongue-in-cheek cheesiness, like they lean all the way into it. They embrace how silly it can be and you can tell that the actors that are playing the century really have love for the franchise. 
it's best just to go with it and laugh at whatever you find funny because the dance fighting is objectively funny. If you are a fan of Sailor Moon and for some reason have never watched PGSM, you need to fix that right now. But PGSM came out 18 years ago. There aren't a lot of wildly successful examples that has come out after it that you can point to and say, this is a vibe we're going for, but a touch more refined. Not the same way as you can do with a pitch about supernatural teens running through the woods at night. Like I said, it's been done for decades and that formula has been proven to work time and time again. But it shouldn't be that hard, right? Magical Girl Warriors are basically superheroes. An all-girl superhero team. Oh, maybe that's the problem. I mean, yeah, it could work with one. There's that show Star Girl I haven't watched. But multiple teenage girls? That hasn't been done before. Especially something very, very pink. Very, very glittery. I don't know. That's a big risk. Maybe if you took a nostalgic property that people are familiar with, so you're guaranteed that audience? It could. Which is why I definitely think a Winx Club live action that is closer to the source material would have worked. Now don't get me wrong, I like reimaginings, I like changes in adaptations. When going from one medium to another, change is inevitable, it's expected. I'd argue it's needed to keep a story fresh and explore themes or characters that couldn't be done previously. When these darker versions of Riverdale and Sabrina the Teenage Witch were announced, I understood why people were rolling their eyes, but characters from Archie comics have gone through just as many iterations through the decades as characters in DC and Marvel comics. Look at the Sabrina the Teenage Witch comics. So many different runs. Then let's take a quick look at all the Sabrina series that were on TV. adaptation of the comics with the same name that crossed over with Afterlife with Archie comics where Sabrina started the zombie apocalypse by accident and honestly why couldn't we get an adaptation of that because that sounds like fun anyways I think where a lot of the anger many fans of Winx Club have for Fate the Winx Saga as a whole is that this is the first big budget Winx property it's the first live action and it's such a major deviation Truth is, a lot of people are just bored with this grounded in reality, dark aesthetic being the go-to for adaptations when they want to be taken seriously, especially for animation targeted towards children, and even more especially with animation that dealt with mature subject matter to begin with. It has become so predictable, hence why all those parody trailers exist. Dora the Explorer has been the best cartoon turned live action movie I have seen in recent years. The original cartoon was for toddlers and they made that into a really funny action adventure family film that didn't take itself too seriously and was just fun. Be more like that. Be more like Dora. Be fun. Now be honest. Is anyone else expecting Disney to announce a live action version of Witch? <laughs> 